Hello, fellow geography students. This is our video lecture over Chapter 2, Population. Please follow along with study guide or review guide um, and come to class with any questions that you have. We're going to start out with um, just some basic ideas of where in the world people live and why. Um, there are certain ways of measuring population. We usually connect it as population density. Um, and we have two types of popula population density. There's arithmetic, which is just the total population um, total land divided by the total population. And then um, we also have physiologic, which is the number of people um, divided by the um, amount of arable land, so land that can be grown on. And so we have um, this map, which shows us our percentage of arable land. Um, and then this one is just a population density map. And it's important to kind of, of really realize where your darker areas are. Um, again, China's got um, the most people, India's second, Europe is third, and the United States is actually fourth. Um, and so understanding those areas of where the majority of the population lie and why is a big deal for this chapter. Um, going into more detail, when you look at physiologic population density, um, you can oftentimes have a, a much more reliable look at how, how the people are distributed within it. It's still not going to tell you where people might be clustered, um, but it still uh, gives you a much more reliable idea rather than just arithmetic population density. So in Luxor, Egypt, for example, the, popu the physiologic population density is going to be pretty high because most people don't, I mean, because most of the land is desert. And so that when you do the physiologic, there's not much arable land. And in actuality, most of the people do live within the Nile River Valley rather than anywhere else in Egypt. Um, and this is a dot map, so this shows you, again, each dot represents 100,000 people. And, and so this is another way to look at where in the world the, the population is distributed. Um, and again, I want you to focus on China or East Asia, South Asia and India, Europe, and then even in, in North America. And you'll see also that our, there are other clusters, like in Brazil and, and Mexico, and even Western Africa, like Nigeria specifically. Um, Southeast Asia has quite a bit. Um, so understanding those areas is a big deal. Um, once again, fourth of the world's population live in East Asia, China specifically. Um, South Asia has the next highest. Europe is third, and North America is fourth. Speaking of North America, the um, one of the vocab terms you probably need to know is megalopolis, and this is where you have sort of a super city that develops from many smaller cities that all, because the populations travel so, so easily between those many cities, it becomes one major super city. And we call the one in the northeastern seaboard in the United States Boswash because of the cities between Boston and Washington, D.C. So specifically, it's Boston, um, Washington, D.C., New York City, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Um, so why do populations rise or fall in particular places? Um, Thomas Malthus is a major um, th philosopher or, or um, geographer connected with population. And he was around or lived during the early 1800s before we really saw um, lots of the advancements in globalization and agriculture. But he was very much worried about population growth. And he feared that since population growth um, expands exponentially, but resources only grow linearly, that at some point we will run out of food. Um, he didn't realize, of course, that we would have the Green Revolution and we would have um, trade networks that would help people out. So it hasn't been as, as bad as he, he predicted. There are still Neo-Malthusians, and Ehrlich is one of those that's discussed. In the 1960s, he talked about this population bomb that essentially, again, the world population just is, is going so fast, doubling so quickly, that it's outpacing the food production. Um, and again, this is sort of that, that uh, Malthusian um, graph. Uh, and in looking at population specifically, if we looked at, at food production, food production would not be um, exponential would be more linear. So it would be, you know, it would kind of like go like this, and at some point you're going to have more people than you have food. Um, so rate of natural increase um, is a, a calculation you need to know. It's really just 
births minus deaths, and then it's divided by 10 in order to get the rate. If you talk about natural increase by itself, that's just births minus deaths. If you're talking about a rate, you have to divide it by 10. It does not take into consideration immigration in or immigration out. Um, and um, uh, is a good indicator of how quickly a population might increase. Um, another good vocab term to know for this unit is the total fertility rate, or TFR. And again, this is the average number of babies born per woman of childbearing years. So when you look at um, certain countries, like um, certain countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the TFR may be something like 5.1, where it's, on average, women have 5.1 um, babies within their lifetime. Um, in other countries where the birth rates come down, you'd have more things like, you know, in the United States, I believe it's 2.1. I think South Korea is the lowest in the world at like 1.3. You have issues when that happens, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit, but the total fertility rate is a good indicator of how quickly your, um, your population will increase, as well as possibly how um, other rates of development may occur in terms of like our uh, people having a good standard of living because if there's bad standard of living or low standard of living, low social welfare indicators, then you you will oftentimes have a higher TFR. Um, so India specifically, um, growth rates are very high in India. This has to do with a lot of different issues. Um, and it also is dependent on the region in which you're talking about. Sometimes if you have more of a rural um, region, like in the east and northeast specifically, you're going to have a higher TFR and you're going to have a higher growth rate in, res in response to that. Whereas places in the south, they may be more industrialized, they may be more part of the global economy, those are going to have lower um, per population growth. Um, now, the reasons for the growth rates, they vary, of course. Um, first of all, the culture has to be considered with this because um, within um, um, Hinduism, you oftentimes have, and, and with, with um, Islam as well, you oftentimes have a, an increase in, in want for more children. Um, you also don't have the access to um, birth control that you might have. Um, you also have a preference for male children. So oftentimes people will have more than two if they keep, are trying to get a boy. Um, and that's oftentimes why you have people with more, more than, more than sort of the, the um, recommended TFR um, or replacement level. The, the, India has tried several things. They had a forced sterilization program in the 1970s that went very badly, riots in the streets, all sorts of things. Um, in 2004, they tried this incentive to um, give gun licenses if you were sterilized. Um, that ended up being um, taken advantage of as well. So for the most pay, play, parts of India, for the most point, they um, have started to just encourage more education and contraceptives available. So, so family planning. It's about the only thing that they can do that's, that's ho hoping to work. As the country industrializes, though, they will find a, a reduction in their birth rate. This is a specific um, uh, picture within India. Um, ultrasound t clinic, so you can <laughs> um, find out what you're having, possibly. Um, but you can also get get um, um, sterilization or birth control at these places very, very easily. So one of the big um, models um, that we find within the population chapter is the DTM, or Demographic Transition Model. It started out by looking at data in Great Britain, specifically um, looking at church records because churches keep track of when a baby is baptized and funerals when somebody dies so that we've got our birth rates and our death rates and that's how the data really came about for the DTM. We can we can use this DTM for every country of the world um, but it specifically was was first looked at in terms of Great Britain um, and there are four possibly five stages um, that have to do with the, the certain characteristics related to birth rates and death rates. So a birth rate is the number of births per year per thousand, and this is a map of the world birth rate. High birth rate is going to be a darker color. You see sub-Saharan Africa is mostly, mostly the darker color. 
Um, and then this is world mortality rate or death rate. And again, this is the number of deaths per 1,000 people in a year. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa has a high um, in world death rate as well, or death rate, um, with a darker number. So the DTM takes those into consideration, and it gets these four stages. So the first stage is considered the low growth stage, and the reason for that is that because there are so many births and so many deaths, the growth of the population is very, very low. It doesn't, it doesn't increase very much or it may decrease even. So you're fluctuating a lot. That's why you've got this sort of fluctuation in it. But either way, if one year the births are higher, or one year the deaths are higher, you're, gonna, you're not going to have very much growth within your population no matter what. So this is considered the low growth stage. High birth rate, high death rate. Second stage is considered high growth. This happens when your death rate decreases. Your birth rate is still pretty high. So people are having lots and lots of babies within the stage, but they have done things that have lowered the death rate. Maybe they have um, um, gotten better medication or vaccinations. Maybe they have clean water now, so there's better sanitation. Um, whatever the case, the, the death rate is starting to reduce, which means that it's high growth because you have just as many babies being born, but fewer of them are dying and fewer of the adults are dying as well. So overall, your growth is going to be very, very high. As you move in or transition into stage three, which is moderate growth, you still have more births and deaths, but there, that birth rate is coming down. Things like uh, more industrialization. So people are moving to the cities. They're not having lots of babies to work on farms. Maybe women are becoming a little bit more educated, and so they don't need to um, depend on a man, or um, they may be educated in how to prevent pregnancy if they want to. Those kind of things are bringing your birth rate down. Until you reach stage four, low growth, again, this is more like not because you have um, high births and high deaths, you actually, it is because you have low births and low deaths. So the growth is low again. You may even have stationary where you have something called zero population growth, and this is where you have just as many people dying as you have people be being born. Some geographers think that there should be a stage five, which would be more like negative growth. This is where you have less births than deaths. And it sounds um, as if something is, you know, catastrophic has happened, but in actuality it's just that people are choosing not to have as many babies. Places in Western Europe oftentimes have this. Um, so um, there is speculation that they should have a stage five, stationary, or even negative. Um, um, at this point I don't expect to have that on the AP exam yet, but it may be within the next few years. Um, so, population composition. This is when we get into our population pyramids. And so, population pyramids tend to be focused on two different things, age and gender, okay? And usually you will find a population pyramid per country. So these are some population pyramids that look fairly pretty. They're more pyramid shaped, where you have your wide base and your very skinny top, more of a triangular shape. These usually indicate poorer countries, however, because, again, you have a higher birth rate, so there's more babies or, or young, young people in the bottom, that's that wide base, but the death rate is also fairly high, which means that people don't make it very long to be able to make it to that 80 plus, which is why it's a tiny, tiny top. So that tells you a whole lot about the um, sort of what stage they might be within. Now, technically, there are no countries that are within stage one of the DTM anymore, but you have a lot of countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, that might be in that stage one to two, that, that transition into stage two, where they still have lots of babies. Their death rates come down a bit, but they still have a lot of disease and, and malnutrition and, and unsanitary conditions. Countries um, usually in like Central or South America, maybe more of that in that stage two, almost to three, where it is still a triangular shape. It's not great, but it's a little better than some of the Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, infant mortality rate is definitely something to consider. And places on this map that are going to be very, very dark green or even a little lighter green, um, like India and, and um, Kazakhstan, these places, Mongolia, these places are going to have a high infant mortality rate. Babies don't live, very many, I mean not very many babies live to be um, past year, a year age. Um, so that's why they have more of that stage one or stage two. Um, now India is a little bit of an exception here. 
because India technically is supposed to be stage three, but because they still have so many people, their birth rate or infant mortality rate kind of, kind of makes them a little bit more confusing. Um, and this is life expectancy. In this case, the countries that are darker are going to be the ones that have a, a um, much better um, standard of living or social welfare. Their pyramids would not be more pyramid shaped, and we'll look at those in, in just a second. But this is where people have good medicine, um, they take care of themselves, they have clean water, and so they tend to live longer. Um, now, countries that have AIDS, like in this case South Africa or anywhere in sort of sub-Saharan Africa, AIDS has created these bizarre looking um, population pyramids. They're considered to be chimney shaped and the, the reason really is that they have this flat top. Like from some age there's just nobody that lives above it. Um, and oftentimes it's a little bit more of a um, not exactly rectangular base, but in the sense that they, that very few, you know, like many, many kids, teenagers, young adults, all AIDS affects every single age group. And that's why you don't really have a good idea of, of looking at the true population um, composition because AIDS has kind of skewed it in a certain way. Here are some population pyramids for those um, well-developed countries. So we have France and the United States specifically. And again, they're going to be not as pretty in terms of that pyramid shape. Their bases are probably a little bit shorter. They may have a larger population in the middle, those working class, and then they oftentimes have larger populations up here near the top because people are living longer, wealthier people. Now this can create um, actually both of these types of population pyramids, both this one and the ones for um, poorer countries have something called a dependency ratio or a high dependency ratio. So in this case with these poorer countries, the working adults are put are dependent on by the by the younger population. All of these people are dependent on these people working to take care of them and that's a high dependency ratio. However, when you look in this case, you have all of these people at the top that are retired that are dependent on the working class to provide for them. So that in turn is also a high dependency ratio. Neither one are great to have for, for a country. Um, again, here's that aging structure. Japan is another place besides Western Europe that you have a high percentage of aging um, or, ret or retired or elderly people that are then dependent on the working class. And they have a, they have a very, um, very low TFR, very few children are being born. Um, again, you want to have a TFR of about 2.1 where you're replacing yourselves um, and um, that means you're not going to have as much of an issue with that dependency ratio. If it's under 2.1, you're not replacing the population. Um, so like in Bologna, which is a region of Italy, it's not the entire country of Italy, but a, really, a region of Italy, their TFR is only 0.8. So they're not even replacing one person. That's a lot of people not having any children at all. Um, which means they're going to have a very high dependency ratio of the working class supporting that elderly, elderly population because they don't have any children that are then going to, to grow up, get jobs and work. There are less people to do that. Um, some solutions to go back to, some solutions to this are um, you can certainly encourage people to have babies. This just happens quite a bit in terms of like monetary incentives or possibly longer maternity leaves, paid maternity leaves. Um, you know, we've talked about Russia and its conception day where they try and encourage people to, married couples to go home and and conceive children. Um, those don't usually work all that well considering um, because people are very focused on their careers and, and if they're not going to want children, having some financial incentives aren't enough to really make them want to. Um, you may in, uh, have to increase taxes to provide for the elderly population. You may have to increase your retirement age so those elderly people don't have to retire soon or don't want to. They don't seem to like that very much. And the other thing you could do is actually increase immigration, which is oftentimes what happens in some of these countries. They encourage countries, um, encourage people to come into the country that are working age adults to contribute to the economy um, because they don't have enough, enough um, the people that are in that, in that age group working. Um, when you have longer life expectancies, so in these wealthier countries, um, you oftentimes um, have chronic diseases that people die of. So rather than having things that are 
um, seen by by many individuals in poorer countries, those disease diseases like cancer, heart disease, uh, diabetes, those things aren't found in those countries because nobody lives long enough to develop them. But in countries where you have longer life expectancy, you oftentimes have higher indi indicators or indi indi um, higher in um, <laughs> people, a percentage of people with these with these um, chronic diseases. So, governments affecting change. The three main population policies are expansive, eugenic, and restrictive. Kind of touched on expansive just a second ago with, with Western Europe. This would be where you are, um, again, encouraging population growth. You want to expand your population. So, again, as I said, you might um, encourage people to have babies. You might um, um, encourage immigration. In eugenic population policies, immigration isn't usually encouraged. Japan is an example of this. They, they really want to keep their culture as being one, homogenous culture. So they, they do not encourage immigration here. Unfortunately, the people are not having babies in turn. So Japan is going to have some major issues in the future with if this can, continues, because they don't have enough babies being born that will then grow up, work in the economy, and support the older population. And if they're not going to encourage immigration, then they're going to have some economic hardships as a result. You also have the opposite extreme, which is a restrictive population policy. This is things like China and their one-child policy, where you really you have too many people and you want to restrict the growth. Um, and so in China's case with the one-child policy, which in turn has been changed since this, but since the textbook. But again, they, they only encourage people to have one baby so that they would lower that um, replacement level and in turn their population growth. They've done a good job of it. Um, unfortunately, there's been a preference for male children because in, in China and in India, actually, both of these occur, you have a culture where when the daughter gets married, she becomes a member of her husband's family and she takes care of her husband's parents. In, in, um, so in turn, you want to have a son to take care of you when you get bigger or get older. Um, and if you're only allowed to have one child in China, then you want to have a male. So, so there's been this preference for a male children, and that's causing other problems in China. Like, you know, if you won't have any future population at all if you have no girls, um, there tends to be, um, more, there's actually more crime in China as a result. I don't know if that's a direct correlation or not, but um, so China, Chinese government has started to um, encourage people to have girls, give more incentives for that, and in turn, because their population has actually um, slowed, they've, they're now allowing certain people to have two children. So if they have a girl, they could try again and have a boy if they really want to. So um, they have restricted their population policy. As we stated earlier, India, however, the only thing they've been able to do is really just encourage education um, because there's still a preference for males and there's there's not the, the communist government telling them they have to only have one. And so in India, they just the government just provides lots and lots of free clinics to give birth control or sterilization or those kind of things. So this is one of those propaganda posters that China has for one-child policy. Um, um, you better have one child only. It's not sort of a threat. But um, again, these would be all over the country in order to encourage people that they should only have one, which is would be that restrictive population policy. All right, so there you have it for population. I hope that was helpful. Good luck. Thanks. Bye.